What up, folks? Welcome to another episode of No Better, Do Better. This is your host, Ray Leonard Jr. We about to get it popping. Y'all ready? Let's go. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your host, Ray Leonard Jr. This is No Better, Do Better. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, it's been a crazy, crazy week. Uh, we had so much happening. Um, I don't know if you've been under a rock or what you've seen, but uh, I got to first start off talking about the George Floyd uh, trial. Um, it came to uh, a crescendo at the end. Uh, I was on my edge. I was scared to death about what the outcome was going to be. And, you know, for, for once in our lives, we actually had, um, you know, something that was positive to happen for the brothers, you know, for, for, for us as a culture, there was justice being served to, uh, for, for George Floyd and his family, uh, Derek Chauvin was, uh, was found guilty on all three charges. And, you know, at, I'm 47 years old, so I've lived a long time. So I've seen a lot of this over my years and, for me to come back and, and finally figure this out and see that, you know, even even sometimes justice will prevail for us. Um, I'm hopeful for the future. I'm hopeful for what's going on. You know, we talk about all the time on this show, no better, do better, about how we move forward, about how we learn from the lessons of, of the past and how we move forward in our history. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was disturbing for me to always see that, you know, there, there was no justice for our people. Um, but as we move forward, as we move forward, as we talk about these things, as we understand the power of our voices, we move forward and we do things that are going to make a difference in this life. Um, you know, when I talk about the show, the title for the show today is called My Life is a Movie. We all have our own stories. We all have our own past. We all have our, our, our reasons of why we do things in life. But sometimes, you know, we get caught up in, in, in certain different conversations. But um, when I look back on, on my life, I, I I'm think about how blessed I am to be where I am today to have this conversation. And each one of my guests that comes on, you know, I'm so thankful to be able to for them to share their stories, for us to talk about their journeys, because I think it helps to know that no matter what level you are, where you are in your life, um, you no, know, we all have struggles, but the cool thing is that we can make a change and we can move forward. And where we are today is just a, a, a stepping stone to where we're going to be tomorrow. So I'm excited. I have a fantastic guest on today, Mr. Trey Cheney. Uh, you might know him from The Wire, from Saints and Sinners. Uh, he's a hometown boy, the DMV, Fordsville, Maryland. So I, I got to give him the love, but you know. I want to want to learn about his story. I want to talk to him about what's going on, what he got going on right now, his journey, his path, and you know, y'all don't want to keep hearing from him from me. So, without any further ado, I'm gonna bring Mr. Trey Cheney to the stage. Trey, welcome to the show, brother. Ray, what's up, brother? How are you, man? I'm so happy to be on here, bro. Man, I'm I'm, I'm blessed, man. You know, uh, it's it's been a uh, as I was talking about earlier in the, my open dialogue, uh, I, I didn't do it as much just as I wanted to do because there's so much going through my head from everything that's has happened. Um, but I'm just, I'm just you know, blessed to be here to have this conversation because, you know, us as brothers, we we are a, a, a dying breed. Yeah, you know what I'm saying for us to be here past the age of thirty is is a blessing in uh, any fast facet for me. Now. So, yeah, I feel the same way, man. I mean, I'm I'm 39, you know what I'm saying? So I'm getting ready to hit 40. But like you said, man, just for, you know, brothers like me and yourself to, to be sitting here right now, just, you know, chopping it up, having a conversation. That's that's a blessing. Every day 
that we're above ground, you know, is it, definitely a blessing. So I'm I'm honored, man, to be on. Oh, oh, perfect, perfect. And um, before before we go into, because uh, I want to highlight you and talk about your path and your life and your career and where, where you've come from, man. But uh, first and foremost, I wanna I wanna you know get get your thought process on this on this verdict, this uh, this George Floyd verdict, because you know we've seen it go the opposite way, you know, so many times, you know, even yeah, we had it in Baltimore, you know, Freddie Gray. I mean, so many of them. But uh, what, what was your thought process when you watched that and saw that come down? Well, well, just like yourself, man, I was on edge and, you know, I was nervous and, you know, I, I, I was scared because I was like, OK, hopefully, you know, this does not go left. Like when when we think something is black people is is we getting ready to get justice. It always goes left. But with the verdict, you know, I was I, I was very pleased with the verdict. And, you know, I, I was glad justice was was finally served, you know, and and. Again, we, we we can never stop saying rest in peace to George Floyd, you know, sending condolences out and, and our prayers to his family and, and just my my take that, that that was my take on it, you know, just saying, okay, justice finally, you know, and, and we still as as brothers and sisters, we, we still got a long way to go. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like this was the beginning. Wow. Wow. And, you, you know, it's funny how we end up learning about people because we would have never known anything about George Floyd if it wasn't for the tragedy that happened to him, right? Right. And, and so when we talk about our lives, uh, I know when I was young, my mother had the conversation with me about you know, what to do with the police. And, and, and when you when you were younger, um, did you did you have have the conversation I had with you about how to react? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, you know what, and, and it's funny, well, not funny when you mention that, but the conversation is definitely, you know, move with caution, don't move too quick. Um, you know, definitely like when you get pulled over, definitely make sure that your hands are visible, that they that they on the dash. But at the same time, Ray, we we see that you just never know. Being being a black male out here, you just never know. It we we might think everything is 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 right like i said and then it could just go left like we've seen done in the past you know so with 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 me having a a black son you know what i'm saying i i had that conversation with him you know so but at the same time it, it's good for us as parents it was good for you know your upbringing my upbringing for our parents to to share this information with us because we definitely have to know so we can instill it in our children so um yeah the conversation was definitely had the conversation is still being had you know unfortunately it still has to be had with with our sons and daughters wow yeah and so i mean i know the conversation because i have the conversation with my two boys and, and even my, my two daughters i mean i've had conversations with, with them about you know we have we have a different level to live up to um but what was it like as, as a young child? You know, I, I, want, I want to start in, in, in the beginning of your life, man, because that, that we, we want we want to go from the from the path of where you started. You know, yeah. you might be MV homeboy, so you know you know how. That, <laughs> I, I yeah. want to know what was like for you, Trey. How, how did how did life start for you? Yeah, well, first and foremost, man, I got to shout out Fullsville, Maryland, Clinton, Maryland, yes, DMV, sir, yes, sir, PG County, yeah, PG <laughs> County, Washington D.C. Um, just being a Prince George's County native, man, I was. I was blessed, you know, to, to grow up in a two parent household, you know, shout out to my mom and my dad, you know, skipping Elaine Cheney. I was blessed to have a lot of family. You know, I, I, I experienced my grandfather. I'm still experiencing my grandmother being, being around my uncles, my, my aunts, my cousins. So I grew up, um, the Cheneys are very strong knit type family. And, um, just coming up, you know, my household, you know, I, I I would like to consider was the house where everybody came to and they and they felt like they could just let their hair down. You know, they could come. You got great food. You got great music. You you watching a dope program on television. And I guess growing up in that environment, that's when I caught that entertainment bug. You know, because a lot of people say. I caught the acting bug or I caught the music bug. Me just wanting to be an entertainer at the age of four years old, um, 
dancing around the house. Every time the family came over, I'm looking at television, whether it was Michael Jackson, James Brown, Bobby Brown, MC Hammer. I'm looking at all of these, these acts and I would repeat everything that they did on screen. And I just, that, that's how it was growing up for me, man. I just always wanted to be that kid that was in the entertainment business. So that, you know, just carried on for a very long time. My parents were always supportive, but it wasn't until I want to say I did a routine in front of the family. My uncle James Cheney um, was like, yo, we need to do something with this kid. You know, we, we, we got to, we got to enter this kid into some talent shows or, or you know, we, we have to expose his talent to the world. And um, I just remember like entering into different talent shows around Prince George's County. And that later led on to me getting an audition at Amateur Night at the Apollo, which, mm. you know, I, at the time I was eight years old. So I couldn't be on Showtime because that was for the adults. But Amateur Night was just as just as dope because it still had the same audience, um, still had the same cash prizes, still could sit backstage with all the celebrities, you know, but still the same. So um, I remember my uncle James, you know, having that conversation with my mom and dad, you know, skipping Elaine and my whole family was just supportive and able behind it. Um, I can literally say, I don't know if they knew what was going to take place during that time or after that, but they were willing to take a chance. Well, well, you know what? We, we got them on the stream. So how can, we, can we ask them? Can we bring them in to ask them? I don't bring know. Them them in. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to see I'm gonna see, see, see what's happening. <laughs> hey, hey, you didn't know you were on the show today, did you? I did not. I did not know. <laughs> I'll bring you on. I, I'm going to put you in the big screen. Put you yeah. in the big screen so you, so you can talk about the But what was your yeah. thought process when he said, I want to be a a, a star. I want to dance. I want to you know do music. I want to act. Because most families, it's like, nah, look, you're gonna have to get yourself a real job and not be doing this. <laughs> right. What was your thought process? Honey, you go ahead. Well, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I was so happy that he wanted to do something that he really loved doing, whether it was dancing or acting or what have you. I just long as he wasn't in the streets, it just made me happy. So whatever it was, it was dancing, I was gonna help him with a routine. If it was acting, I was gonna hold a script and make sure he knew all his lines. Mm -hmm. So no matter what it was, I was always there to support him. Yeah. That's beautiful. And what about you, Pop? Because you know, we always have the conversation, you know, a lot of us growing up, especially in Maryland and, and and, and, and uh, you know the places that where we came from, you, you don't, you know, sometimes you don't have the two parents uh, from a, from a black family together. You know, right. there's such a struggle that there's so much that we got to go through to stay together. Uh, you know, what was that like for you guys? Well, when when I always told Trey, if you want something, you got to work for it. And um, what he he was always like he said he was watching some of the entertainers and uh, expressing what he wanted to do. So Manny Lane were like, well, let's just back him up because it's something positive, anything positive. Because I have a daughter too, he has a sister, but he being four years older than her, he kind of like took the lead. And if it was anything positive, then we went for it. And we were always around uh, entertainers and, 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 and different uh, boxers, your dad and, uh, you know, everything. <laughs> I mean, we grew up in that era. It was wonderful. And, um, you know, we were right there in Whitfield Woods. Uh, it was just a, a, a wonderful thing. And then to watch him uh, advance, he, 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 he mastered his craft because it got him all the way up to, because we were in the Bahamas when he called and said, hey, Dad, I, I did an audition for a show. I said, Trey, you can't act. What are you doing? But he went on <laughs> eight, five years on, on the wire. And I was like, OK, you don't prove yourself. You all right. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's awesome to, to see the success and see the family together and see their growth. So, yeah. you know, I, I appreciate you and I applaud you guys as parents because I know how hard it is. Because I sometimes I, my kids be saying they want to do something. I'm like, ah, you know what? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> show me first. Y'all to show me first. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. But we, we applaud you and, and I thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to highlight your son a little bit more and we may bring you back a little bit. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Love you, mom and dad. <laughs> you know, but you know what? You know what was dope about that though, Ray? Um, that 
you know, when my parents just got on here and they, and they spoke about me knowing what I wanted to do, you know, I, you know, when they would ask me in elementary school, you know, when you ask a lot of kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? That might be a confusing question sometimes. But for me, I knew. I said, I want to be a dancer. I want to be a hip hop artist. I want to be an actor. I knew it. You know, so to, to be sitting on here having this conversation with you, we're talking over 25 years later. I'm still doing what I said I was going to do. I'm still making a living off of it, despite whatever trials and tribulations came during the years. Because, you know, it's that that yin and yang sign. It's that whenever it's a whole bunch of light, a whole bunch of positivity, great things, you got to prepare for the darkness. So it was some dark moments in between. But me, I'm attached to the process. I'm in love with the hustle. I'm in love with the grind and I never get emotionally attached to the end result or the reward. You know, I eliminate the reward mm. and just say, I know with me doing the work, it's going to happen. You know, that, that whole manifestation thing is, is where I'm at in my life, you know, and like I said, being in this business for over 25 years, just honestly creating my own environment in my own head saying, okay, despite what anybody thinks or how they feel, if I know this is right, if this is if this is giving me the energy, the positive energy, if this is feeding me, if this is making me want more, I have to go for it. And that's how I've been my whole life. Man, that 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 is phenomenal because I mean, I still don't know what I'm doing. I still don't know what I want to do, what I want to be. I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, <laughs> I, I've I've had spells like, yeah, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. Uh, you know. Yeah. All my DMP people that, that's doing this, Southeast DC, everybody's on here. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I still still figure it out. And I guess you go through iterations in your life too. Because, you know, there's been points in my life that, uh, you know, that I was like, this is this is where I am, this is what I'm going to do, uh, and keep it moving forward. But, um, you know, I think things change as you know. But but you you knew right right off the top. You knew what you were going to do. You, you had that path. And you, know, you, you focused on it and said, here, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to do. And you, you made it happen. But in the process of making it happen, I know there's some ups and downs. I mean, you, you started out when you were eight. And, 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 and as most people, it's, it's your dream. You know, you have to follow your dream. But at eight years old, you have no idea of all the ups and downs and trials and tribulations that's going to happen throughout you pursuing your dream and your goals. Was there a point early on that you said, I don't know if I can do this, or that I wanted to stop? Well, early on for me, Ray, it was, okay, of course the dancing was one thing, you know, at, at, at that early age. Then it, it was the point where my parents decided, okay, now you need to focus on education. So you're not going to be going across the country or going here and there performing that might have been a little point in my career during my teenage years where it threw me off like okay well i'm used to doing this i'm used to touring i'm used to performing i'm used to making my own money when i go on the road and now i have to focus on education which the best thing for me you know the best thing for all of our kids you know when when your parents make that decision but during that time in order for me to take my frustration out, I started turning towards the streets. Anything you could think of that was negative, you know, getting involved with the games, getting involved with, you know, trying to sell drugs. I never was a, a good drug dealer, but I can sell anything, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, um, you know, just getting involved with, with a whole bunch of negativity and not doing well in school. So I guess that was the time where it was the, almost like the rebellious tray, you know what I'm saying? But it, unfortunately it had took something tragic. You know, one of my friends, a good friend of mine who, who was, you might as well call him my brother, who, who was killed, you know? So the message that I relate to a lot of young people when I speak to them is I say, don't wait for something tragic to happen before you, don't wait for something tragic in your life to happen before you decide to change your life. You see what I'm saying? So. You know, unfortunately, that was that's what happened to me. And that's what made me say, you know what? I need to focus more on my craft, my career, 
Um, when I graduated from high school in 99, thank God, you know, my, my parents stayed on top of me, the teachers, the principals, they was all, you know, behind me because they knew that I could do, I could do better. And, um, you know, graduating from Forsville High School, shout out to the Forsville Knights, <laughs> you know, uh, graduating from there. Um, after that, I knew, I said, you know what? I'm getting ready to pay for my own pictures. I'm getting ready to pay for my, you know, my resume, my bio to get, you know, real tight, real good. And I'm going to start submitting to these different talent shows at Lincoln Theater. I was 18 years old. That was my last, well, I want to say not my last, but that was like the performance that Linda Townsend Management discovered me. And she said, I don't specialize in dancers or hip-hop artists. I want to submit you for a television show because I can see that you're not stage fright. You could be a good actor. I, I had always, remember I told you, I had always wanted to be an actor. So it was almost like that just came to me. And she said, the first show, it was in 2001. She said, I'm going to submit you for this show called The Wire, an HBO series. Oh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on for you. Hold on for you get there because we, we, got, we, got, we got a lot to talk about with that. So I, I, I know. I, I, I want to go back to you being on, on stage in the theater. And uh, it, you know, the Lincoln Theater, the Lincoln Theater is historic in DC. Historic. Now, I did I did a boxing match there you know, several several years ago, and the TVs and all that kind of craziness. But the Lincoln Theater, I mean, that is is is, is the mecca, and you're yeah. performing there. So was that from from high school that you're performing there? Uh, that that you're performing on stage there, or what, what was that from? It's like a, 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 a some, some kind of different theater that you were. Well, Lincoln Theater, it was it was straight out of high school, like straight out of high school, because like as soon as I graduated, I started submitting to different talent shows in the area. And it was actually Russ Parr who was hosting. My man, yeah. Russ Parr. <laughs> yeah, Russ, you know what I'm saying? And Russ has always been so supportive of my career. I mean, even back then, before we, you know, later on, he started directing me in some some popular shows, but um. I had submitted and they just, you know, they picked me to, to perform and compete against at least like 10 other people. And all I was doing was dancing. I was, cause I'm, I was, I started off as a hip hop dancer. So about 18, 19 years old, you know, like I said, I was fresh out of high school and I was able to, you know, I had my own car. My parents made sure I had a car, I had my driver's license. I was able to move around. And uh, uh, it's so crazy because a lot of this stuff I, I found on my own, you know, I back then with the yellow pages, you open up the book, you like, look, I'm gonna call oh, oh, yellow pages. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a sip of glass in my wine for a second. Hold on. <laughs> you said man, I'm yellow. talking about, oh man, I'm, that, I'm, you talking about, right now. I'm talking about looking through the yellow page. I'm talking about if I seen flyers in a grocery store, anything that had to do with entertainment, I was on top of it, right? I was, I was calling. I'm like, yo, my name's Trey Cheney. This is how old I am. I got my own money to, to, to pay for the entry fee, whatever, you know, mm. because I wanted it so bad. So Lincoln Theater reached out to me and was like, we got a slot for you to perform on this show. If you win first place, you get $1,000. If you win second place, you get 500 You win third place, you get 250 <laughs> i never forget. I, I said I wanted one of them. Even though I had that 1000 on my mind, I said, you yeah. know what? I'm getting one of them, and when I went, I won first place. It's it's video it's video footage on YouTube right now, clips of that performance, which people still kind of like throw it at me to this day because you know now I'm I'm this actor, so they like you used to dance back in the day, you know. But yeah, man, that was a real highlight because my whole family showed up. Um, it it was it was I got a standing ovation. I. I made the routine up myself. I did my own mix on the tape. That's when you had to record from tape to tape. Like it wasn't like I ain't had no DJ or nothing. So I was just recording music that I wanted to dance to. And I, and I just remember, man, just working hard at putting this stuff together. And I won. You know, I, when I won first place, that's when other opportunities presented themselves. So you 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 jumping off and you like okay here I'm I'm I'm, I'm gonna do my thing I'm gonna get out here I'm dancing but but you also thought that okay here acting or whatever you was gonna be in entertainment 
Now, for you young folks out there that don't have no idea about what the yellow pages is, because you can Google them, yeah. <laughs> and everything everything is at your, at, your, at your fingertips, the yellow pages was like, like a directory that we had to actually go through and find out, you know, people's names and actually make a phone call. You couldn't text nobody. You wouldn't send no emails. You were making phone calls. So that is real work. That was real work being put in to follow your dream. So salute to you, Trey, for that, man. And and uh, I, I know we have the footage that dance is somewhere around here, you know. So I, I may have to have to bring it, you know, uh, shortly to to the table. Um, Most you know, yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to just put you out there right now. So we, we, I'm gonna give you a chance to. To, to relax a little bit and enjoy it and get it all before I bring it in. I might bring it in and see what you can bring it about when we have the conversation. Right. So, so you on there, you, you, you're doing your thing on, on the stage at the Lincoln Theater. And you get noticed there at the Lincoln Theater? Lincoln? Yeah, it was at the Lincoln Theater. So somebody notices you and then that leads to you going to your first audition. So Linda Townsend, she was actually sitting in the audience. She was sitting in the audience of the Lincoln Theater, and um, she came up to me after I won first place, and she was like, Trey, I've been following you. Because during that time, you know, I had been on the news, Channel 7 and Channel 5. I was- Tommy Davidson too, didn't you? Huh? You performed with Tommy Davidson? Did I perform with Tommy Davidson? I think I did. I think I opened for him. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Uncle James said so yeah. you did. Yeah, I did. I did. I did perform with Tommy Davidson. That was some because my uncle, one thing about my uncle James, James Cheney from Concert Connects, he would he would um put me on bills with it, it didn't matter if it was comedians, if it was just singers, if it was all different types of people, you know. So I would perform on not just a bill with just all dancers. So I was able to, you know, gain a fan base like if somebody was coming to see, for instance, Tommy Davidson. And I was the opener. Now I just gained all of his fans, you know, or, or the fan base that was there, you know. Right. So, yeah, just opening up for different people, man. Linda Townsend, like I said, she was in the audience and uh, she ended up, you know, coming up to me and she was like, I'm, I'm a talent like manager slash agent. I don't I don't work with artists that sing or dance. I only work with actors. But she said, I could tell that you're not stage fright. And when she said that, that hit me because I was like, you know what? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I've, I've been performing. Sometimes I rap on the mic, you know, so that that meant I knew how to memorize words, you know, memorize lines. And um, she said, I want to submit you for a television show. If you don't, if you're up for it, let's let's get some paperwork. And, you know, I, I want to submit you in the first job she submitted me for was the wire that's crazy you know the one of the most iconic shows one of the greatest shows of all time and in my opinion the greatest series of all time uh not just because it was in baltimore in my and in, in maryland my hometown but because of the character development and all the killer characters that came from it the actors that came from it and the majority of, of you guys didn't have any experience exactly <laughs> No, when you look at that from a, from a realistic standpoint and how you, uh, you know develop these characters, it, it was crazy that you know that a show like that wouldn't be put together, and um, you know, they bring in you folks from that that didn't have you know much acting experience in, on a, on, a, on a professional level. I mean, you know, sure we we all did it in front of the TV and had the dreams about it, but right. when you get on the camera and they say, "Here, you know, action! You need to bring up this emotion, or you need to act this way," it, it's a whole different thing. Yeah, it's definitely a whole different thing. Um, so tell, tell us, before, before you go into that, tell us about the, the initial audition. I know you had to go in an audition. Oh, man. Yeah, Pat Moran. And, and, and if anybody knows who Pat Moran is, you know, Pat Moran is one of the hardest casting directors in Baltimore City. I say around the world, though, because she's a no-nonsense casting director, and she can tell when you haven't been in that realm of actors. You know, she could tell if you never did this before. Right. So that was my experience. I walked in, you know, I was auditioning for the character Weebay. So I walk in and, and she said, um, Slate. And I was like, what? Slate? 
what you mean? Jack, you're out there or any person out there that don't know what a slate is. Now I know it's your profile. When you turn side to side, <laughs> you slate your name, your height, you know, your age, if they ask, if they require. Now I know all of this stuff. So I was like, I don't know what you what you mean. So she was like, slate your name, your height, your age, and the role that you're reading for. And I slated it. And she she had a monologue that I had already went over. You know, I was already able to go over the monologue. And she said, um, okay, I'm I'm gonna call action, I'm gonna hit record, and you you slate, you do the monologue. And I remember back then I was kind of like, I was still on book. I would look up, look up, look up. You know, now I'm going to just skip real quick. Now I ain't on book. When I go to auditions, I got the lines down pat. Okay, slow, slow it down because we got to explain it to the audience out there too, you know. You say on book, just like Dan, you ain't know what Slate was, they don't know what on book is. So, on, book, so on, to- on book is when y'all got the paper. If, if, if I'm a cast director and I give you a script, and you walk in the audition with the paper and you looking up and down. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's cool, but it's not, it's not how we do things. You know, as an actor, they give you a certain amount of time to remember everything that's on that paper. So you tr- you wanna go in off book. That's what off book is when you go in and you got the lines right here, not on the paper. So my first experience, I had the paper. So. When I finished reading it, she looked at me. She said, I could tell you never acted before. Mm. And I was like, but at, at the same time, it was her. And she, t- she still tells me this over 20 something years later. She said, I was just, I was trying to break your confidence, but my confidence never broke. She said, I could tell you never acted before. Um, do it again. And I said, I was honest with her. I said, no, I've, I've never. I've never auditioned. I've never did a slate. I've never did anything, but I'm going to do it again. So I was still confident in who I was as an actor or who I was getting ready to become. And I remember doing it, did it again on the paper. And I went home um, and and I, I went home feeling like I know I didn't get it, which is a thing that I don't suggest nobody to do. Well, hold, hold, hold that thought, Trey. We got to go to a quick commercial. We'll, we'll, we'll come right back. I, I want to I capsulize that moment that you went back home and you say, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> after, after the audition. But yeah. hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is No Better Do Better. We'll be right back. The Black Owned Institute is where we teach children and educators the Black history is American history. Did you know the first person to stand on top of the world at the North Pole was a Black man? Matthew Hinton reached the geographic North Pole in April 6, 1909. Did you know the first black doctor treated patients in the 1800s in New York City? James McEwen Smith, first black man to become a doctor of medicine in the United States in 1837. Did you know one of the quotes in every U.S. passport is a quote from a black woman educator from the 1920s? The cause of freedom is not the cause of a race or sect, a party or a class. It is the cause of humankind, the very birthright of humanity. Anna Julia Cooper, one of the first black women to earn a Ph.D. in 1925. The Black Owned Institute exposes the hidden figures who made unforgettable contributions to the United States, yet are not featured in our history books. Starting in kindergarten, children will learn about Black and African history. They'll gain a more complete picture of the role Black Americans played and continue to play in making our country great. Become a part of this historic movement. Join the Institute. Black Owned Institute. Dot com. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to No Better, Do Better. I'm your host, Ray Leonard Jr. Um, you know, make sure you go check out our, 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 our group, uh, Black Owned Institute and Black Owned Talent Hub, uh, doing some amazing things, um, saluting all the history of all of us that have, that have put, put stuff together, all of our uh, forefathers that have paved the way for us. So you know, make sure you go check it out and support. You know, we thank you for doing that. Um, I'm coming back. We've been talking to Trey Chang. The 
actor, entertainer, dancer, phenomenal person, and my DMV homeboy. And he was just talking about, you know, his experience in his audition, his first audition, which was with The Wire out of all shows. So we're going to bring Trey back in here, and we're going to talk about that night after he went home after his first audition. So, so Trey, when we left, you were talking about, you know, after you were done with your first audition, and you had this doubt in your head. Like, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So, so go ahead and elaborate on, on what your feelings were after your uh, audition and, and what you were thinking after that when you went home. Well, well, Ray, the doubt that I had in my head was just basically, you know, me saying, I know she was trying to break my confidence, but at the same time, I couldn't let that get in my head to a point where it discouraged me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I said, I feel funny, but at the same time, something is going to come out of this because it was one thing I was honest with her. When she asked me, have you ever done this? I told her, no, nah, I wasn't going to lie. You know what I'm saying? If she was going to give me the role, she was going to give me the role. So what ended up happening was me feeling that way. Three weeks later, I get a call back. For anybody out there that's listening right now that don't know what a call back is, it's when the casting director feels that you might be right for the role. And now they want you to audition for the actual producers and directors. So when she said, my my manager at the time, Linda Town, she called back. She said, hey, they called you back. They want you to read in front of David Simon, the creator of The Wire. Uh, they want you to read for Nina Noble, the executive producer. They want you to read for all these HBO heads up there at HBO. But when you go, you need to go off book. And remember, we taught a lesson today, Ray. Going mm -hmm. on book, you gotta go up in that joint with no paper. You got, you got, you gotta know it. You gotta understand. You gotta have your dialogue in your head. You can't look at the paper. So, so what happened was, I said, um, I said, okay, I'm, a, I'm gonna go in there with, with no paper. So when I walked in, you got David Simon in there, right? That's the creator. Right. Right. How, how, how long? How long was? How long was the How long was the how long was what? How long was the dialogue that you had to read? It was at least a page. Okay, full page. Yep. Oh, yeah, man. it was a full page. It was it was a real it was a real monologue. You know right. what I'm saying? And you you know what a monologue is. It was yeah. a real monologue. And um I remember going in there and they said slate. I knew how to slate. <laughs> so I slated my name. <laughs> yeah, my first time. So I slated my name, my height, my age. The role I was reading for, and once I slayed it, they said, "All right, get into the dialogue." So I started reading, and I fumbled over some words, mm. and I said, "Hey, um, do y'all mind if I do this again?" Because I did fumble over some words, and I want to make sure that I don't fumble the next time. And they said, "Okay, yeah, 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 sure. You, you're, you're a pretty honest guy." So do it again, but this time, don't mess up. That's what they said. They, they told you don't mess up. They told me that. They said, this time, don't mess up. Don't don't fumble. Mm. And I'm telling you, man, it was through the grace this, this of God. This is an opportunity of, of your lifetime. Everything that the culmination, uh, you know, at your young age, the culmination of what you've been working for, it's right yeah. there. In your, they say, here, this is your opportunity. Do not mess up. Everything flashed right there. And, and my next point, like I was saying, it was through the grace of God that I was like, you know what? I'm getting ready to nail. I'm getting ready to nail this. And and I did not fumble over no words. And I just remember I, I made eye contact. I made eye contact with who I was reading with. And. And they just looked at me with a blank stare. And they were like, all right, cool. And I left again. Feeling like, OK. Did I do something right? Did I do something wrong? And um, I got a call a week later, right? And they said, Trey, you didn't get the role of WeeBay, but they casted you for Malik Pukar. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 you know what I'm saying? Well, you ain't get this role. 
But we got another role. We we got a role that's going to introduce you only in the first episode. Mm. Only in the first episode, you're only going to have maybe one line. That one line end up turning to all five seasons. Wow. wow. All five. You say you got one line. <laughs> they said I'll, I had one line in that first episode. If y'all pay attention to that first episode in the first season of The Wire. Matter of fact, it probably was a half a line. You ain't even hear it because I was fighting. Was, what'd you say? I was fighting. I was like fighting somebody and I said like a curse word or something and that was the line. <laughs> wow. Wow. And after, so, and after that, it was, you know, it, it, it was just, it, it was the best experience of my life. The Wire, HBO, working with Idris Elba in the beginning of his career, Michael B. Jordan. I mean, like, the, the, you know, The Wire, they're still calling The Wire the greatest show of all time. And, and we're, we're going on 20 years. Exactly. Exactly. What we talk about it. When I said, I said it might be the biggest show in my show for sure. You know, I know my friends, people that's on here that they 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 love the show, um, and, and yeah, I, I still don't think it got the credit that it needs. It needs to be a minute, you know, but when it was happening, it, it was incredible. Um, and I know probably most of you guys had no idea, had no idea that. It was it was moving in that in that direction. I'm sure you had no idea that that this it was going to be as big as it was. But when you first got cast, first got cast, did you call your parents and say, you know, hey, y- y'all told me to get an education, but guess what? I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be a child. <laughs> Mom and dad was actually in the Bahamas. Oh look, I, I'm um, skipping the lane. Was just we're just talking about that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring them in. If they okay? To bring them in one more time. Like, they, yeah, he, 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 Story. Bring it back. I want to hear the story. I want to hear the whole family story. So I'm gonna bring it back in. So, <laughs> no. I put y'all back, back on, back on the spot again. Because I, because you said you were homeless and the story was happening. I want to hear what it was like when he first called you and said, "You know, I got the part." <laughs> well, when he first told us he had the part, we laughed. We could not <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> Because we could not believe it. Like, you an actor? Where did this come from? <laughs> and we thought it was just a joke. I said, maybe it's just something just going to blow over. But it didn't blow over. Five straight years. Uh, so what, what a phenomenal vacation. You know, vacation, you ain't in the Bahamas. You're like, hey, and my son got a job, too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, it was yeah. something. Oh, that's beautiful. James James on here saying saying what's up, skipping the lane. Yes. Hey, brother in law. What's up? <laughs> right. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, so so what so what was that like, Trey, to, to be a, to tell you tell your family that, you know, all this all this stuff that you've been working for, you've been telling me you're gonna do it and it finally happened. Um, for me, it was just uh it, it was definitely a, like a rewarding feeling because, I mean, to say it in a, to say it in a great way, I proved to my my parents that this is what I wanted to do, and I did it. You know, so it was more like me setting setting an example, saying, "Okay, I said I was going to do this, and I went for it." Like my father said, "You know, whatever you want to do, you got to work hard for it." I went for it. I worked hard, and I made it happen. In that case, I worked smart. You know what I'm saying? Because, like I said, The Wire, get getting the opportunity like that, being from where I come from. You know, a lot of brothers and sisters don't make it from Floresville and D.C. And they don't get to fulfill their dreams like I did. You know, so just not being a statistic, you know, like falling victim to the streets and saying, okay, I'm getting ready to go for what I know and I'm, and I'm getting ready to really pursue this career. It was a rewarding feeling to tell mom and dad, look, I booked it. I'm getting ready to make my own money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm getting ready to, um, we're all about to experience this journey together. And when I tell you, this entertainment business, when, when, when that wire hit, like I had just turned 21, 
because I was able to go to clubs. Ooh, hold on. Hey, 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 skip in the lane. You know what? I, I appreciate you. You're not no young man. I'm about to put him in the hot seat, though. So I'm going to put you on the next stage again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Here we go. Here yeah. we go. You get the role. You with this phenomenal cast, and you're 21 years old. You got the world is yours. You're in your hometown. Nonetheless, you in Maryland. So you feel yeah. good. And you're 21, and you got to act for it. Like, like, you, you can't ask for much better than that. What was that like? Because I know the first time I, I was in the space, man, like, I was 21, I played my thing. It was a problem. <laughs> Wow. Man, it, it was, you know, for me, right, it was like that experience was just something totally different. You know, like like being on a successful show, just turning 21, able to go to the club, not just going to the club, but getting paid to come to the club. Right. Yeah, to get whoever I wanted in the Yeah, then able right. to get whoever I wanted yeah, there's a whole other game. in the club. And, and a bunch of access to just anything. I mean, you, and you know what I mean. Anything, whatever, whatever I want, you know. I'm gonna tell you for that. That first year, you know how they say we turn up. I, I turned up hard and at a young age. I seen a lot so fast. I seen money come. I I lost money. I mean, just just so much, so much happened during that time. But like I say, it was some of the best years of of my life, you know, and. I don't, I don't regret anything. I had, I had a great time. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and the wire, it did teach me lessons. It did. One thing it did teach me was definitely save all of your money. Save your checks. Don't go out here blowing money on just anything just because you who you are. And, you know, you could wind up with nothing. And, and it was moments like that throughout the seasons where I sometimes would have nothing. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. So, 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 who, who was was on the set of the wire? Who was who was the the, the person that you leaned upon uh, most? The person you leaned upon most that said, "Okay, here, I need some advice. I need to got an old head. I need to listen to um, that's going to put me, you know, back where I need to be. I need to, uh, you know, check myself because you no. Know, once you first get that money, once you first get that success, that spot of fame." It, it, it's just addicting. I mean, it, it for any young person that's coming up, it, it's hard to say, you know, I'm just going to go do the right thing. When you have, like you said, you had the access of, of everything in the clubs. Everybody knew who you was. You coming in there, like, like they, they like, here, here, you just get this, get boom, boom, boom. You're getting paid to go to the club. <laughs> it, it, it is a whole nother world from coming from like, all right, well, about a couple of months ago, ain't nobody know my name, but now <laughs> I'm the man. And so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And so was there an old head that was on set or somebody that you trusted that said, okay, here, this is how you're going to navigate this thing? You know what? Um, I got to give it up for Larry Gilliard, who played D'Angelo Barksdale. Mm. That was, that was, Larry, Larry, Larry's a little older than me, and, and Larry was somebody who had been in the business longer than I had. Um, they gave me a lot of great advice, man. I mean, they were so approachable in anything that I ever wanted to ask them. They answered me. Wendell Pierce also, you know, Wendell Pierce from Waiting to Hotel. Yeah. Um, Wendell was definitely somebody who. Huh? Oh, no, we, we, we break. Yeah, you, you break, you break, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. So um, what we're going to do, we're we going we gonna to go to commercial. We're going to see if we can bring, bring you back in and see if we get a better connection. We'll go to a quick commercial and come back and see if we can get you in. Okay. All right.
right, we back. We back, folks. Welcome to No Better Do Better. We back with, with Trey Cheney. Uh, we was talking about the whole episode, the whole function of, of uh, being on the wire. His, his initial, his first, imagine your first big, big show is the wire. And he's 21 years yeah. old and this kind of success and on, was on this show. He was supposed to have uh, one one line <laughs> and then turn into five seasons. Wow. So, I mean, you look back at it, it's, it's insane. It's phenomenal. To, to talk about that. But we were talking about mentors and people that were looking out for him um, as, as a young man uh, on the set. So go, go, go back into that. Because before we let you, you were talking about you know, uh, Gilmore and, and all those cats that were looking out for him. Yeah, so so Larry Gilliard, man, was was definitely you know who played D'Angelo, um, definitely somebody who I would go to advice for Wendell Pierce, you know who, who played the Waiting to Exhale. Everybody knows who Wendell is. Wood Everybody Harris. Knows. Well, you know okay, right. Wood Harris. Yes. Yeah, that's the OG right there. I mean, these guys were just in my corner, and, and, and you know what's so crazy, man? They still in my corner to this day. You know, so starting off with them with it being my first role, my first job as an actor, and then now them seeing me advance to everything that I have going on now, they can honestly say they were there in the beginning. They were there when I was the kid running up to them every day like, man, I'm going through this. I'm having this type of issue. How do I deal with this? What do I do? You know, and and they um they would they were just were in my corner. You know, and, and, and I'll never forget that. A lot of the information and knowledge that they gave me is still with me to this day. Man, and, and it's crazy because I, I, I actually, my, my wife and I we just started watching The Wire again uh, about a few months ago during the pandemic. We started watching it again from the first season. I'm like, I'm that Omar and Snoop and I, all the characters. I saw all y'all, like, man, it was crazy seeing it. I, I, I forgot how many how many you know, stars that are now from all you guys that were in that in that show. And yeah. look back at everyone from Idris and everybody. I mean, it, it, it's crazy to see the, the, that one show spun in the career of so many phenomenal actors that may not have ever got a chance if they didn't say, "Here we want the real Maryland, we want the real Baltimore, we want the real real phase of it." They would never right. got a chance. And Idris brought something from England. I'm like, I don't know how he did that. <laughs> Right, but but he, he played he played the role and it shows shows his face as a phenomenal actor. Um, it, it was heartbreaking uh, for all of us to see when it came to an end. Mm-hmm. You know, the show came to an end. Uh, so, what was that like for you when you comes to an end? You like, okay, here I'm going to my next show. Are you just ready to move on to something else? Well, a lot of people, you know, I, I I'm I'm gonna release some information right now that a lot of people may not know. The Wire never got canceled you know so so mm-hmm. no it never got canceled they really? Simon, i don't know what you know what what they had going on over at hbo or with their own production company but at the height of the wire as big as it was david simon and the the crew decided to take it off you know so that's one fact it never got canceled so who knows you know if he if he drops the drops the bomb one day and say hey the wire coming back we might still got a chance, but uh, hey, hey, that happened. You tell me, like, he didn't know the DMV boy in there, <laughs> yeah. I know, right? We coming, we coming back in together. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact, brother. But now, nah, man, so so when the wire ended, you know, I remember thinking Hollywood was gonna call my phone and I'm gonna get all offered all of these robes. And, and I, I moved to LA for two, three months. I was eating noodles and noodles out of my, one of my homeboys' apartment, sleeping on his boots on. Nothing happened. Nothing. Mm. Nothing came through. By that time, my contract was over with Linda Townsend. I remember going home and it was just a real tough time for me. You know, I had to go back home to my mom and dad. It was, it was a tough time. I was married. I was married at the time. Well, not at the time. I'm still married. I've been married for 17 years, going on 17 years. But at that time, it, it was just rough. You know, I wasn't bringing in no income. And that, the wire ended in 2008. Right. So 
for a good two years, it it was just it was it was that darkness for me. It was right. the darkness, and I got to give credit to a, a homeboy of mine. His name is Torrance Hall. We call him Booby. One day, I want to say, you know, during that two year period of it just being rough, he said, "Man, you don't realize that you're a walking billboard. You on the wire." Everybody around the country knows who you are. You mm. have a book. I had wrote a book during that, during the seasons of the wire, like just about, you know, inspiring people to follow their dreams, motivate them, encourage them. Um, I was still, you know, every now and then doing music, putting out songs. He said, you got songs, you got merchandise, you got a book. You need to get out on the streets of D.C. and sell your own product out the trunk of your car. I'll help you. And it sounds crazy because, you know, for entertainers to this day, I don't know no entertainer that would have done it because they would have felt ashamed or, you know, they would have had to go through being looked at a certain way because you were on this huge show. But now you out here on the streets of D.C., 13th and F Street, near the Warner Building, selling out the trunk of your car. But, right. Ray, I did. I mustered up the courage and said, I have to step outside of who the celebrity is because i don't have a dollar in my pocket right how am i going to support my wife and my kids how am i going to make money i'm not selling drugs i ain't going to the streets right so i took that inspiration from my brother torrent and i remember the first day i got out there it was people walking past me laughing saying what are you doing out here you on a wire why do you why are you selling merch out of the truck of your car like it was some people that didn't buy and it was some people they did buy. Right. Ray, for five years, 2010 to 2015, I built a fan base standing on the corner of 13th and F selling merchandise, uh, building relationships, big time lawyers walking past. Yo, you the dude from the wire? What you got? Hey, man, I got my T-shirt. You know what I'm saying? I got my book. I started producing my own content with films, independent filmmakers in Washington, D.C. I did this film called Lorenzo and Monica. I did a film called Dead Money. I'm talking about what they consider low budget. For, to me, it was the greatest thing ever. I said, you know what? My homies, they own cameras. They can, they can write scripts. I know a bunch of different actors. And I started for, like putting out my own content. I stood on the streets for five years straight and when i tell you the fan base that came from that that i still had to this day mm. it was incredible I, in between while i was doing that i was getting calls from bt my man jamal hill he called me he said trey i got a movie it's starring meek mill before meek mill was even huge right. like he is now right. we did a film called streets bt picked it up that was everybody's kind of like first yeah, for the first the first joint they seen Meek Mill in. <laughs> right. First joint they seen Meek Mill in, but then right. seeing me, it was yeah. like, oh, that's the dude for the walk. Right, right. So, so they, they, they took the credit on him too. Yeah. So then after that, Jamesy Boy came. That was with Ving Rains, Murray Louise Parker, James Woods. Right. Um, so that came. And I, I had a I had a part in that, and then they featured one of my songs in the movie. So all of this was all of this was starting to happen because of the hustle and the drive that was that these casting directors and these directors, writers, and producers were getting. They were like, yo, this dude is, you know, it's something special about him not being scared to get out of his comfort zone. Because right. that's what that was, you know. So was that was that where the, where the humble home came from? Or was that was that, you know, strictly about music? I mean, what was your, your, your music? I mean, the, the hungry humble. That that's that sounds like what, what it is because most yeah. of them, when the lights shut out, no matter what level success you is, I mean, people run from you, man. When, when you on the bad side, <laughs> right? I, I, I've been there. I've been there. I say that they like here. They hear you, you, you say something like, well, why, "Why you working? I got to pay bills. Exactly. <laughs> I got to take care. Of. I gotta get, it, it ain't it ain't no it, it is no no." Uh, uh, you can't, you can't be ashamed of, of the way you are or what you're doing. You know, there, there is no exactly. shame in be working and being where you got to be, man, no matter what you are. You know, and, and that makes the, the success when you have it again more precious to you. Yeah. So, Hungry, yeah. So, Hungry, Humble, Honest, that was the first EP. 
all of those songs were written just based off of my experiences being on the streets and you know i mean but but still positive content it was positive music because right. i did records like dedicated father where yeah. i spoke about you know being in my son's my daughter's life and my mom my, my mom and dad my, my dad being in my life my grandfather um just uplifting black men as, as fathers to be there for their kids and you know, records like Radical Readers. I was doing things that other hip hop artists wouldn't do. I was rapping about young people reading 30 minutes a day, right. you know? And I, was putting this, and I was putting the content out, going against the grain in hip hop music. Then when I did Mike Bully, they focused on young people not bullying each other because there's so many young people committing suicide because they don't want to go to school because they're being bullied. Right. That's, when, that's when BT, MTV, they started running my videos. They started playing these videos, and then that was the other segue into music. So that picture I sent you today with me and Big Daddy came when I was eight. Yeah. I reminded him of who I was as that kid, because Big Daddy Kane was a fan of mine, you know, from The Wire. So when right. I showed him that picture, I'm like, I was the kid backstage at the Apollo, winning first place. Now I'm here. You know, when I first seen Big Daddy Kane perform, on stage that inspired me to want to be an artist. Mm. You know, so sh sharing that story with him and all the way up until now, years later, him still being my OG, you know, me touring with him, you know, definitely before COVID, you know, but like everything, all of the steps and all of the decisions that I made up until this point got me to, to hear, to speaking to you, you know, so, so it's that, for me, it's about, you know, certain decisions. Like, what I do today, is it going to be talked about in the next five to ten years? You know, this interview right here is going to live forever. Right. It's going to be on the net because what we're doing, we trade energy. We're yeah. inspiring each other and we're inspiring other people. You know, so that's how, that's like my motto for, you know, when I was on them streets, I knew. I said, you know what? Something is coming out of this. Right. God, God is not going to have me sitting on this corner broke but me doing something positive, putting out my own content for nothing. And then, like I told you, I did it for five years. Bounce TV, Saints and Centers, they offered me a series regular role. Offered. I didn't have to audition. So Saints and Centers first when it comes about. Another phenomenal show. I mean, the, like the show, the shows that you've been on, and it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. But 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 your path and, and the struggle that you have for that period of time. Sometimes you know, you, know, God, you say God come with you for a minute to say here you gotta get ready for this next journey, this next level of success to come. Uh, so sometimes it will humble you, put you back, and say, "Hey, is your faith strong enough to still deal with this? What what the success is not give you?" So maybe that that time that you had, that you know, the time that I had, that I was struggling. I was like, man. I don't know if I'm gonna come back from this, but I believe in myself, and I was strong enough to say, "Okay, yeah, I know I, I can do it." And right. um, you know, I, I, I think sometimes we, we we have to be able to to put our egos aside and say, "Okay, here, this is this is a, a test, or this is something that's gonna test my my faith and everything else that we have." But we move forward, and the best that come now, because where you are right now, the things that's happening to you right now, is phenomenal. So, you know, what was it like when you get the call, Saints and Sinners, okay, you don't have to audition. We, we already know what your game is. Come on here. Man, it was, it, it was another, it was one of the best experiences because I it, it made me think about what you just said. It made me think about all the, the hard work of being in those streets after the wire ended in, you know, just still having the love for the process. I was in love with the process. I did not think about the end result or the reward. I thought about if I keep working, something comes out of anybody that keeps putting in the work as long as they walking in the right path and doing it the right way. And I knew I was doing it the right way. You know, I, I didn't know if it was all the way right. I mean, but it ended up turning out to be right when Saints and Sinners called and said, we heard about what you were doing. We heard about your independent films. We seen them. We see you still on, you know, popping up on stage with artists. You you still performing. George Pierre was the person 
who casted me for Saints and Sinners. He's the one of the biggest casting directors here in, in Atlanta. I always say around the world. Because right. all the casting directors that ever worked with me, they gave they gave a, a young kid from Forestville, Merlin, Prince George's County a shot. You know, so when they called, George said, you got to move. You got to move to Atlanta. Not move. We're going to fly you out and put you up for two months. Mm. So flying from DMV, <laughs> leaving my wife and my kid, but for something that, you know, for work. Right. That first season, that second season, it popped off, right? And But I found myself, after I would finish filming, I would I have to go back home to D.C., which, you know, Atlanta's popping with entertainment. It wasn't a lot of entertainment happening in DMV. Right. So going into third season, I want to say this was around 2016, 2017. That's when my wife, Aisha Chaney, who I've been married to going on 17 years, two amazing kids, my son, my daughter. Salute that. Yeah, it's a salute black love, salute black marriages. I'm right with you. I'm 17, I'm 18 years. Yeah. 18? 18. We're I got right you behind each other. I got you by one. I know you got me by one. <laughs> so we had a we had a deep conversation because, you know, sometimes as men, we feel like we got everything figured out until that queen comes in and hit you with a question that could change your life. And she said, what are we, what are we doing? Are mm -hmm. we going to keep on staying content with living in DMV and you leaving for three, four months at a time and coming back and it's not really, you know, popping here for you work-wise? Or are we going to make a jump and move to Atlanta? And regardless of whether we fall on our face or whatever, we're going to hang in there and we're going to get through whatever. Because she seen, you know, potential in me that I didn't see in myself right. at the time. But I'm this, uh, you know, I'm the man. I'm like, I got everything figured out. But I, 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 I understood I was being content with living in DMV. Right. I was content with flying to L.A., New York, Atlanta, and then going right back home. But I, I tell everybody the first time I ever felt fear, because I don't fear anything. But the first time I ever felt fear was when I drove in that U-Haul from D.C. to Atlanta, those 10 hours. I wanted to turn around and go back home because I didn't know what I was getting into. It was the the fear of the unforeseen. Right. Right. But you talking about three and a half, four years later, it was the best decision me, my wife and my son had ever made. Yeah, well, you, ju you jumped out on faith. Yeah. Jumped out. Jumped it's out not easy. It's not easy. And, and, and I'm telling you, brother, that there are uh, I got, like, eight years on you. So, I mean, there, 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 will, there will be more of those moments. <laughs> so, 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 do not, do not, do not let, let, you, let your spirit go, go weak. You know, it's my exactly. But uh, it, it's, it's, you know, such a pleasure that you can hear, you know, your story and your past and what's going on, man. So, uh, what's, what's happening now? I mean, what, Come on down, like give the people the best. Twenty was a hell of a year for everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. what was that like? What was twenty twenty like? And now, well, 2020, 2020 for me, right, was the year of sitting still. Because right when every right right when the pandemic hit, I lost probably I lost I lost so many so many projects. I lost at least. 10 to 15 speaking engagements. I lost two films. Um, another TV show that never came back around. So instead of me panicking, I said, this is the moment where I'm getting ready to really get to know self and really understand who I am as a man, as a husband, as a father. And, and my and is my mode or my attitude going to change because something happened and I didn't get what I thought I was going to get, you know? So it, again, I tell a lot of people 2020 was the best year of my life because when I sat still and when I understood what was happening, I said, okay, it's time for me to be creative. So I started giving them flowers while they still here on IG live. I started mm -hmm. interviewing some of my best friends in the entertainment business you know, from Kenny Lattimore to Wood Harris to 
all the cast members almost from the wire um genuine I, so so i started i started like like bigging all of my friends up you know basically just letting them know that everything's gonna work out everything's gonna be okay and um then you know a couple of months passed a couple of months passed things just kept kept coming up you know because it wasn't just the year of the pandemic we were faced with everything black lives matter i mean we, we were we started getting hit right right <laughs> i look at anybody right now that survived 2020 and say you ought to be committed congratulations right <laughs> so um that was the year for me that that let me know that i could survive and i could make it through and i could push through along with still <laughs> having to be a husband having to be a father you know i, I everything just kind of like came down at once and then that's when secret society the movie that i got right now this top five on amazon prime with vivica fox erica pinkett rain of love jeremy meeks that's when they called in august that was my first project during the pandemic where of course we're under the restrictions of taking the COVID test. Right, right. Having to take that COVID test two, three times a week. We shot that project. Then Saints and Sinners came calling him back. Like, okay. There you go. These are, the, these are the guidelines. This is how we living now. You got to take right. the COVID test. And man, it, it, it was almost like, is this what God was preparing us for? Like, because we didn't fold. We didn't fold under pressure. Now we right. see paying a reward. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And, 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 we, and we've been through it. We played that. I told you when we were talking about you know, that time that you were you know, selling, selling you the CDs on the back of the car. I mean, that was preparing you for a moment like this. Preparing for a moment like this. You know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different world. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad at the, the space that you're in. Um, the things that you that you, your parents have instilled into you, man. You, the the love of your of your family to be here, to be a black man, to be strong. Um, married seventeen years with, with with your family and kids, and still doing your thing, and not losing your faith after all this that that's been put pressure been putting on us. So we appreciate you. We salute you. We salute you. We could talk for another two hours about you know everything else that's going on, you know, family here. But uh, man, I, I just just wanted to honor you and thank you so much for being on the show. I want to bring your parents back on and honor them too, with you know, for, for, for being here. Please do. Yeah. I, 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 I want to give, give you guys, you know, uh, credit for, for raising like, an amazing son and, and you know, for all the things you do because I think parents sometimes we don't get the credit that we deserve. So I want to salute you. Guys, you know, for thank you. It. Thank we you appreciate so much. that. Yeah. And I, I thank you and I honor you as, as parents and you know, um, you know, just a black man and woman for, for being strong and, and leading us. So um the show is know how to do better. And so I hope to continue to uh the past and learn uh, you know, have a better future. So you know, Trey, uh, skip in the lane, skip in the lane. Any last words before we get out of here? We just want to thank you, you know, for having us on. And uh, just giving Trey an opportunity to tell his story, and because uh, it is a wonderful story, but what you're doing also is wonderful. Giving people the platform to be able to do it, and that that's really was that's really was wonderful. And uh, you know, tell your parents we said hi from parents to parents. You know, so we appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we appreciate you that. You have an awesome podcast. Oh yeah, we love it. yeah. We enjoyed it. Oh, oh, thank you, thank this you. Is, thank you. Ray, this is a big deal for me, man. Um, you know, just to be on here with you, and I've never uh, did an interview where my parents were featured. So this is the first <laughs> time. I can't wait to post. I can't wait to post this because, you know, I mean, like you said, just seeing the the strong bond of the black family, we don't see that a lot. And and you were somebody who who, who made that happen today. You know, I mean, from yeah. you know my mom and dad, my uncle was on here. A couple of my friends I seen, you know, popping in and out. So I, I was real, you know, I'm, I'm real privileged and, and honored to be on your, your platform. And um, no better, do better. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pump this thing 
for a long time, Manny. I mean, and just some words that I'm a, that I'm gonna leave off with is just um, you know, anybody out there that got a dream, you know what I'm saying? Just I say this a lot. Sometimes it's good to to detach yourself from the dream. It's cool to hold on to it, but once you detach yourself and throw it out there into the universe, man, you watch the business on it get handled and then it comes back to you. You know, and then next thing you know, you got an abundance of blessings, whether that's, you know, the just being a better person. You know what I'm saying? Being able to inspire and motivate people around the world, you know, that, and that's what that's what I'm about. So um, and definitely stay attached to the process. I say that a lot because so many people give up. I came up with so many people, man, it's, it's not here today because. They gave up, you know, they couldn't handle the trials and tribulations or the or, or the stresses and strains of the business. And but but it's it's not about like I said, I always say it's not about the reward. You gotta fall in love with with the everyday life, whether that's struggle or you just gotta know that you, you keep putting in the work, something positive coming out of that. I'm living proof. My oh, man. While I was on this call, I'm getting offers right now for films. So oh, something is happening. Something is happening. Like like <laughs> like, like move forward. Hey, I like it. I like it. That's good stuff. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to first thank the Cheney family. I want to thank Trey. I want to thank Skip and Lane for being here. I want to thank all of you for 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 showing up for for another episode of No Better Do Better. Um, you know, like I say uh, all the time, you know, know your worth. When you know your worth, you're able to see your worth. And seeing your wealth does not just mean from a financial standpoint, but from a mental standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, and from a physical standpoint. Know your worth and you'll see the wealth. Um, my grandfather always told me, do the best you can till you know better. And when you know better, you do better. I'm Ray Lennon Jr. We'll see you next time, folks. Thank you for joining. Peace out. Thank you.